Hello, I'm Kirsten Shepard Barr. I'm acting director of Torch. Um, I just want to say welcome to Linguamania here at the Live Friday at the Ashmolean Museum. Um, here we have the opportunity to share research with the wider public and enjoy a late night at the museum. Linguamania has been curated by the research project team Creative Multilingualism. You can see some of the many members listed on this poster behind me. Now, TORCH is the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities, and we support and facilitate multidisciplinary research and enable wider and public engagement. And it's my pleasure, a great pleasure tonight, to introduce Elika Bomer, who is our next speaker. Elika Bomer is the director of TORCH. I'm just her understudy. I'm just doing it for this term. Um, she's also the professor of, of world literature in English in the English faculty at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Wolfson, Wolfson College. Elika has a long list of publications. I'll just give you a, a few. Um, they include colonial and post-colonial literature, empire, the national and the post-colonial, 1890 to 1920, and the biography of Nelson Mandela. She is the author of four acclaimed novels and a short story collection. She edited the British bestseller, Robert Baden-Powell's Scouting for Boys. Basically, what hasn't Elika done, is what I often ask myself. Um, she was a Man Booker International Judge, 2013 to 15, and she's also director of the Oxford Life Writing Center at Wolfson College. Um, Professor Bomer will be doing, uh, she'll be reading from and engaging with her recently published novel, Shouting in the Dark, which dramatizes living between worlds. Elika. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, it's, it's quite an introduction to live up to. I'll, I'll try to do my best. But first of all, I would like to beg your patience and read something very appropriately for this evening in another language. It is from um, the Dutch translation of my recent novel that, that Kirsten just mentioned, The Shouting in the Dark. Um, I was going to say this later, but maybe I'll just say it now. This novel is all about tacking between worlds, between Africa and Europe, between North and South, between different cultures, but also between languages, between two languages in particular, Dutch and English. And what a pleasure it was when this novel, The Shouting of the Dark, was translated into Dutch um, by a wonderful translator, Joost Poort, with whom, however, I worked because I know Dutch. So that was very interesting to see him, as it were, render my story into another language. So here goes. Het probleem kan niet met haar Engels te maken hebben, zegt ze tegen zichzelf. De vader heeft het geven van Engelse les zelf ter hand genomen. Hij is haar tutor geweest. Sinds de tijd dat ze samen in Durban naar de schepen keken. English, English, schreeuwt hij als ze per ongeluk terugglijdt naar het Nederlands. Engels is de geweldigste taal ter wereld, zegt hij met zijn knauwerige Nederlandse accent, waarmee hij de Engelse klinkers verminkt. Het is de taal van wereld, wereld voor over, aars. Het heeft de glans en de jeu van de Engelse zeemacht. Ik zal ervoor zorgen dat je beschaafd Engels spreekt, de taal van Churchill. Ik luister niet naar je als je iets anders spreekt. Je mag blij zijn dat je opgroeit in de Engelse provincie Nataal. Waarom zou ik er anders voor gekozen hebben naar de oorlog hier te gaan wonen? op de enige strook van Zuid-Afrika waar de Britse vlag altijd trots heeft gewapperd. Thank you for your patience. Was there anyone in the room who understood any of that? One, two, brilliant. German speakers, a little bit? Okay. Right. Let's go to the English version. The problem can't be to do with her English, she tells herself. Her father has dealt with her English. 
He's been her coach since the time they'd stood looking at ships in Durban. English, English, he shouts if ever by mistake she slips back into Dutch. English is the world's finest language, he says in his growly Dutch accent, mangling the English vowels. It's a world-conquering language, zesty with England's sea power. I'll have you speak the Queen's English, Churchill's language, he says. You speak anything else, and I will not hear you. Consider yourself lucky to be growing up in this English province of Natal. Why else, after the war, did I choose to live in this one strip of South Africa where the Union Jack has always flown high? I'll read a little bit more in a bit, but first I just want to talk a little bit about these two languages between the juxtaposition of which I have spent all my life. I'd like to ask now, how many people in the room have another language in their repertoire, one that they're perfectly comfortable with? This isn't too self-revelatory, I hope. Raise your hands high. Wonderful, fantastic. And the monolinguists, do declare yourselves. A few, great, well thank you for confessing. Are there any people who, um, having raised their hands about facility in another language, um, are also bilingual, which is a slightly different condition, actually. So, hands up high, let me see. Wonderful, okay. Now, let's gather some words from these other languages, these one, this wonderful word horde that we all bring into the room. Here is a man on a horse. Um, could all of you who raised your hands if you knew another language, whether bilingual or multilingual or trilingual, could you all shout out what that is? Not in English. Okay. Part. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, now, there's a man on the horse. Uh, I, again, I would like, this will be interesting actually, I, I would like you to say what your other word for man is. Mom. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, for those of you who are specifically bilingual, um, this is an interesting condition. It's being studied. Um, and differently from those who have learned their second or their third or indeed fourth or tenth language at the age of about six or perhaps 12 or 11, for bilingual people, there's always, according to the research, a slight discomfort, a slight sense of need, not quite belonging in either language, always being slightly out of kilter, slightly out of joint. I grew up at first with Dutch, and then at about the age of four or five, I acquired English, not at home, but but outside from, from, from friends, from playmates, from friends of, of my parents. It is now the language that I'm most comfortable with using uh, because I speak it on a daily basis. Um, I go back to the Netherlands very, very regularly and I'm always aware once I'm back there how slipping into Dutch is like putting on a pair of old slippers. Fantastic, I'm kind of back where I belong. But I also notice that it takes a couple of days for my spoken language to adjust. There's, you know, I'm not quite hitting the A's quite right. Um, and that is a strange condition for somebody who would claim this language, Dutch, as my mother tongue. So I just want to read a short piece from not, not the recent novel, and, but, and it's something in English, you'll be relieved, uh, all of you, to hear, um, which tries to capture something of this condition of being not quite at home in either language, always slightly out of sorts, dreaming one night in one language and one night in the other language. Is this an experience that others bilingual people around the room have? Yeah? Great. And it's kind of not to be entirely at home in your language, it's an odd condition, but 
And this is a really important point, and it's the main point, actually, I wanted to bring to you tonight with this bite-sized talk. I think it is the most wonderfully rich and fruitful condition for creation, for the creative writer. To so have to make that jump, that journey between the two words, in the two words or more that you have for everything is a kind of trigger to the creative act. And for those of you bilingual, trilingual, multilingual people who are not yet writing or creating or, or uh, performing in your two languages, I would strongly encourage it. And here I try to capture something of this dilemma and joy of being bilingual. It's the case that bilingual or trilingual people don't, as a rule, fe feel fully at home in their different languages, don't feel they completely master or have command over any one tongue. They are, linguistically, neither here nor there. I know that late at night and when tired, my English sounds to me ungrammatical and rough-edged. To this day, I over-egg sentences with participles and have to think carefully about the different direction, towards me, not from me, represented by the word borrow as against lend. Nederlands has one all-purpose word, lenen. For me, the sense of unhomeliness was exacerbated first by the forced suddenness of my father's shift to English, and then by my own many shifts within and across the English-speaking world. Having lived in Canada for a time and living now in England, I have an, on occasion been abruptly reminded of the, the foreignness of this language that I claim. Or, more accurately put, this language has, following a series of colonial concatenations, claimed me. During my first two years in England, I was at pains to frame simple sentences to make myself understood in bus queues at tills in shops. Could I have a packet for my shopping, please, I used to say, rather than a bag. How much does a ticket for this bus cost? And it was a coach. Unwieldy, non-native phrases. It felt like learning to speak the language all over again. Yet Dutch, that original root language of mine, has not grown in comfort with the years, if anything, the opposite. Nederlands remains the language of my dreams, of sudden emphasis, of half-inarticulate passing emotions, muttered to myself. It was years before I could swear in English as I could in Dutch. My relatives in Leiden and Arnhem remark to this day on my perfectly idiomatic, homegrown-sounding speech as they do on my lovely BBC English. But the fact that they make their remarks signals that something somewhere is amiss. Somewhere the rules are being broken. My Dutch, because it is the language of childhood, of play and domestic space, has not always grown up with me. I am no longer able to swear in a plausible 21st century way. My vocabulary is fuddy-duddy, clogged with 1950s verbal tics copied from my parents that long ago fell out of use. In Nederlands, too, I feel I don't fully belong. If it came to some test of authenticity, I would surely fail.